Welcome to our worship service recorded for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, July the 25th. We give thanks to God for the opportunity to share and worship in this way at this time and uh, invite you to access the website at thelivelyanglican.ca for the paper resources that will help guide your worship experience. We begin with a quotation from John's Gospel. My sheep hear my voice, says the Lord. I know them, and they follow me. Our liturgy continues with this invitatory. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. We'll sing our first hymn, the hymn, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Praise the one who breaks the darkness with a liberating light. Praise the one who frees the prisoners, turning blindness into sight. Praise the one who preached the gospel, healing every dread disease, calming storms and feeding thousands with the very bread of Praise the one who blessed the children with a strong yet gentle word. Praise the one who drove out demons with a piercing two-edged sword. Praise the one who brings cool water to the desert's burning sand. From this well comes living water, quenching thirst in every land. Praise the one true love incarnate, Christ who suffered in our place. Jesus died and rose for many, that we may know God by grace. Let us sing for joy and gladness, seeing what our God has done. Praise the one redeeming glory. Praise the one who makes us one. As, we, as my assistant again today is my wife, Mary Beth, uh, we are dispensing with any uh, mask-wearing protocols. Our first reading this morning is taken from the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah, the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. 
When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people were fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed is psalm number 14. We'll share the reading responsively by the half verse. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all. To see if there is any who is wise, if there is one who seeks after God. Everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all these evildoers? Who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear. Because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted. But the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be glad. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Our second reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus 
went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias, a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near, and when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a good deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And when Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the words of my lips and the thoughts and the meditations of all our hearts will be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I believe habit caught me there when I announced that the gospel was according to St. Mark. It is indeed according to St. John. There is a common theme that, to which we've all been exposed in our lives as churchgoers, and that's the idea of, that we are journeying with Jesus. I like the word journey more than I like the word wandering because journey has a destination. When we're on a journey, we have a purpose. On this journey with Jesus, we are heading somewhere, heading somewhere for a particular purpose. And that purpose, because of our partner on the trip, is, of course, closely tied to Jesus' purpose, which includes bringing God's light into the world. Now, of course, there are other benefits of Jesus' purpose. So I wonder what you think about his purpose as he traveled with his disciples around the shores of the Sea of Galilee. I suspect if I were to open the floor for comments, I would hear things like, well, he came to save us for his, for, from our sins, or he came to find the lost sheep. Well, those are correct answers, of course. And among these and other correct answers, I want to focus on the idea that Jesus was making disciples as he traveled in companionship with those who had come to call him Lord. Now this isn't so much a description of his purpose as much as it is the method that he used to accomplish his purpose. A former teacher of mine, Dr. John Bowen, who was also the former head of the Wycliffe College, Wycliffe College's School of Evangelism, prefers to use the word apprentice to using the word disciple, and I must say I'm beginning to agree more and more with him. Because the goal for an apprentice is to become skilled at the work in which the master is skilled so that this same work can be carried out by the apprentice with greater and greater ability. 
Well, we know that Jesus was a master at living a life in obedience to God. Part of his task on earth was to enable and equip a group of people who would also become masters at living life in obedience to God. And so, Jesus gathered his group of disciples and showed them what such a life looked like. And after his resurrection, Jesus commanded them to repeat that work with other people by making them disciples as well. This action is, in fact, exactly what God has been doing on earth since the beginning. Granting authority to humanity to govern was part of the original design, and it seems the expectation was for the human beings to work in obedience with God. This work in which Jesus was involved provided an opportunity to include others in this project of restoring and redeeming. So as we look at the passage from John's Gospel, I invite you to look at it from the perspective of, of a master showing his apprentices how to live in obedience to God. In the course of his actions, Jesus and his disciples found themselves in the midst of a very large crowd who were going to be there over an extended period of time. With the desire to make sure this gathered assembly had something to eat, Jesus asked his disciples to do something. Their reaction is one with which I am very familiar. Staring at what seems like an impossible situation, thinking that it's probably time to make a contingency plan has been a frequent part of my life. In one version of this story, the disciples basically say, let's cut our losses and send them all home. I find myself hearing those same words coming out of my lips from time to time. I can't count the number of times that I've done that, and I wonder how many of those times I've missed an opportunity to seeing the wonder, of seeing the wonder of God because I've been far too practical. The master of living a life, of, a life in obedience to God trusted that the same God who caused manna to form on the desert floor each morning could feed the crowd. And he wanted his disciples, it seems, to grow in that area of understanding. We tend to panic and make contingency plans while all Jesus did was ask them what the inventory included. Our growth as disciples sometimes ask us, asks us to suspend that practical nature that is part of many of us and to try to do something that we think is unbelievable or impossible. You see, I have learned that becoming a disciple of Jesus is much more than simply agreeing to a doctrine or attending a church service from time to time. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is much more like being an apprentice and learning to behave like the master in all sorts of circumstances. But of course, agreeing to the doctrine and attending church services are important aspects of being a disciple of Jesus, but there is so much more. The miracle of the loaves and fishes stands as a call to us to grow, to become agents of change, the agents of change that Jesus wanted us to be, lights in the world. And we were reborn to become that very vessel. It's difficult at times to be a disciple or an apprentice, but it's more rewarding than anything else the world has to offer. To be part of the work of holding back the darkness that threatens to overwhelm is a joyous and a humbling privilege that has been granted through Jesus Christ. And disciples aren't really expected to get it right every time, but it is hoped that growth takes place after a beginning is made. We heard today that, that terrible story about King David. His story is also filled with triumphs as well as these tragedies. 
successes and failures as he grew as a disciple of God. He had been placed in a position of tremendous influence and he was instrumental in bringing about some very healthy and helpful policies. But the story we heard today, of course, is not an example of a healthy choice. As a disciple of God, David showed that he needed to learn some lessons about self-control. The entire account of the story, as it goes beyond his, his plot to, to kill a, an honorable man, includes a confrontation by Nathan the prophet and then followed by David's heartfelt confession. And we know from the rest of the story that God restored David's status as a faithful disciple with a lesson well learned. His story reminds me of the need to learn some lessons about self-control and to rejoice that forgiveness and restoration is always possible. In the face of what looked like an impossible situation, God made a way. Our friend St. Paul knew something of this as well. This impossible situation being helped out by God's love and grace and mercy. I believe that's part of the reason why he wrote his letter to the Christians at Ephesus and the reason he included this beautiful prayer. Let me read it again. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I think it would do us well to meditate on the words of that prayer on a regular basis. I have often used it as I communicate with others about my desires for their lives. Comprehending with all the saints the length and breadth, and height, and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and to be filled with all the fullness of God is the desire of God for us. As disciples of Jesus, we are offered the fullness of God, the abundant life that Jesus talked about, and the opportunity to cooperate in the work that Jesus did and is still doing. In order to accomplish that well, we are being asked to do what we, we would be wise, sorry, we are being asked to do, uh, to place our lives in the hands of the master, who is the master of living a life in obedience to God, to learn at his feet how to do the same kinds of things. In the years following the resurrection, as Jesus' disciples meditated on this event that they all experienced, the massive feeding of 5,000 and more, it was obvious that it had become a major moment of growth because of the fact that it's among the very few stories that appear in all four gospel accounts. And so I think it would do us good to take some time over the next week to put ourselves in the midst of that story to imagine ourselves as Andrew or Philip, to imagine ourselves perhaps as one of the, the participants in the meal, imagine ourselves as a little boy offering his five barley loaves and two fish to this utterly, unbelievably large crowd. Perhaps we will see something that says something about to us about 
growing as disciples. You see, our role as church in this darkening world is still to shine God's light, to spread forgiveness and reconciliation in our path, and to encourage others to join in this journey with Jesus, this journey with a purpose. We are not to wander aimlessly, but to travel purposefully in the company of each other and the God who made us who breathed new life in us and who promises to fill us with all the fullness of God so that our lives will be lives of abundance. May we, as followers of Jesus, grow as disciples of Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. respond in faith, at first using the words of the Apostles' Creed, then a hymn, and then prayers. Please join me as I recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite you to sing along with me as I sing, Jesus, the very thought of me with sweetness fills the breast.
So in the midst of God's presence, in the company of Jesus our Savior, and with the life of the Holy Spirit coursing through our bodies, we bring to God those things that are on our minds and in our hearts, our thanksgivings and promises, our requests, our petitions. We give thanks to God for the connections we have with so many people, the ways in which they have enriched our lives, the lessons we have learned by forgiving and by giving thanks. In our parish, we are surrounded by friends and acquaintances. This week, we are being asked to offer Dan and Cindy Harbottle to God's uh, abiding presence and Paul and Kathy Flewelling asking God to bless them in the, what they do this week. We have some people who, are, um, who, who have asked our particular uh, petitions for their healing. We ask God's healing upon Thelma and Wendy Vivian, Spruce, and Tom. We give thanks and continue to pray for the frontline workers who serve in the midst of this pandemic. And we pray for in our diocese for Archbishop Anne, for the territorial archdeacons, the regional deans, the lay deanery officials who support the, the work of God in this diocese. And we ask God to support their ongoing responsibilities within the deaneries and to the executive committee of the diocese. And we pray for the members of that executive committee as they contemplate and deliberate over matters for the well-being of the entire diocese. And in this deanery, we, we pray for the congregation at the Church of the Ascension who are searching for a new priest and for their interim priest the Reverend Canon Dr. John G. Bow. And so using the litany as printed in our leaflet, we pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to all nations, an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise that all may share the good things you provide. Lord, Hear our prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying and your comfort to those who mourn. Lord, hear our prayer. And together we pray the collect of this day. O oh God, God, the protector, protector of all, all who trust, trust in you, you without, without whom nothing is strong, nothing, nothing is, is holy, holy. Increase, increase and multiply and upon us your mercy, that, that with you as our Lord ruler and guide, we may so, so pass through things, things temporal that we lose not the things eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And for our final hymn, let us sing, The Love of Jesus Calls Us, Our Joyous Praise to Sing. calls us our joyous praise to sing our deeply felt thanksgivings we now together bring for all God's many blessings unasked yet still received and for the generations who faithfully believed. The love of Jesus calls us that we may always be companions on a journey where all the world may see that serving Christ is freedom which time does not destroy where christ's command is duty and every duty joy the love of jesus calls us to go where he would go to challenge all that limits to change to learn to grow, to know that Christ has freed us, that prisons are no more. For those who seek his kingdom, Christ opens every door. The love of Jesus calls us in swift changing days to be God's co-creators in new and wondrous ways that God with men and women may so transform the earth that love and peace and justice may give God's kingdom May the peace of God, that peace which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Thanks to God for the reopening of, of church buildings for public worship. We will once again meet on Sundays at 9 a.m. at Christ Church and 11 a.m. at St. John's. We give thanks to God for this opportunity to share over the Internet, at which we will continue to be offering uh, at least until September. So let us now depart from this worship time in joy and in peace to love and serve the risen Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.